we have a last session where we're looking to the future. Uh, and of course, the future has uh, various foreboding elements. Uh, and we've got three brilliant speakers. Uh, we have Andrew Bradley from uh, the, the uh, Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Uh, we have Robin Shattuck, who's one of the world experts on vaccine therapy. And we have Sean Griffiths, who is indeed a, a true world expert on public health issues. So let's start with Andrew. And Andrew, I think it's true to say that the mortality of patients when they get into hospital, especially to famous institutions like the Mayo Clinic, the mortality uh, that we're seeing is falling. So the, the doctors are doing a good job, I think, uh, faced with a terrible problem. Uh, but of course, as when we come on to Sean, the issue is, are, are, uh, uh, can, can we stop patients getting into hospital? So, can, Andrew, can I start with you and say, you know, we have some evidence about new treatments. And, and is it true that we're doing better uh, in ITU and in the hospitals in terms of caring for our patients with this awful disease? So I, I think that's true. And, and thank you for inviting me to this, this uh, wonderful session. Uh, I think it's true that our ability to take care of patients is improving over time. Um, I think there's multiple reasons for that. Uh, first and foremost is general medical care. We're getting a, a greater uh, understanding of the disease process, of when and how to intubate, um, when and how to start anticoagulation, as was discussed in, in great detail earlier, um, when and what drugs to use. Um, I like to make comparisons between where we are now and, and 20, 30 years ago when we started the HIV epidemic. Um, it, it took us uh, several years to get any uh, therapies that had a sense of activity. We've accomplished that now in a couple of months. Um, we, there's wider availability of drugs that do work like remdesivir. Um, we're about to get uh, clinical trial data from large data sets in other uh, therapies. Uh, that includes other antiviral agents, that includes other immunomodulatory agents. I'm optimistic that the results that we're going to see for IL-6 and IL-6 receptor antagonists will, will be positive. And then there's a whole new class of drugs that uh, are beginning trials which have different mechanisms of action uh, that I'm very optimistic about. And those include uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies, uh, recombinant antibodies, uh, GMCSF targeting therapy. So I, I absolutely do believe that um, when a patient is diagnosed and needs to come into hospital, our ability to take care of them is better than where it was two, three, four months ago. And do you think these developments are, that uh, are partly due to the research that's been done in, in not only the UK, the U, uh, USA, so many other countries? Um, I mean, and, and, and what research do you think we need to do for the future? Obviously, we need to establish uh, which of these drugs is best and which combination and which type of patient. Any thoughts about what research we need to do for the future? Yeah, so, so lots of thoughts along those domains. You've mentioned many of them. Um, we're beginning to get a sense of which drugs are active. Um, we need to now understand at which stage of disease to use them better. Um, the, the trials that have occurred and, and every center has seen countless trials proposed, uh, they tend to focus on that uh, patient population who is admitted with an early AA gradient, uh, not yet ICU bound. Um, probably that's because that's uh, the most common group and, and a group for which you can show differences. I think uh, as time goes on, we need to stratify where you are in disease stage uh, and target therapies to each different stage. So uh, we're beginning to see trials now of outpatient therapy for patients with uh, mild to moderate disease. We need to focus some uh, more attention on those who are already in the ICU. You made mention of combination therapies. We're starting to see those coming up. Uh, we know through the history of, of uh, successfully treating viral diseases, and I'm thinking HIV and hepatitis C. We know very clearly that multiple therapies are better than one, and I suspect that will be the same for um, SARS-CoV-2 infection, and we're beginning to see some combination antiviral trials, uh, and we're beginning to see trials of antivirals in combination with different either small molecule or 
uh, biologic immunomodulators. So moving forward, I think we'll see different stages of disease, combination therapies, biomarker-driven approaches. It's, it's um, absolutely clear that not all patients uh, respond in the same way to the same therapy, and that's probably based upon where they are in stage of disease. Uh, there was a fascinating report that was published in JAMA in the past few days showing that TLR7 inactivating mutations is associated with uh, worsen disease outcome, and I think that's the beginning of what will be a large flood of data that we'll get in upcoming months of how genetic host uh, polymorphisms are associated with differential disease outcomes, and I think that's going to be a critical area as well. Well, great, Andrew. I was going to go straight to Robin, but I've just heard uh, exciting this uh, job as being sort of combat here. Just heard that we do have Dr. Musanira from Uganda on the line. I think because, you know, we're talking globally here, not just about uh, uh, Northern Europe and North America. Uh, it's important that we, we consider countries like Africa. So, uh, Dr. Musanira, uh, Monica, are, are you there to tell us a little bit about the situation in Uganda? I'm hoping this works. Thank you very much. Um, I'm attending on my on my phone, so because I'm still on my way home. Hope it can be clear. Do you see me? Uh, thank you very much for having me on this conference. Um, um, our experience in Uganda is uh, uh, it's a little unusual. Uh, one in that we have had a very slow development of the disease, not accidentally, but uh, because we had a lockdown quite early and we benefited from the challenges of other countries, we got all the knowledge. So most of our cases have been identified when they are mild. The majority of the cases have been mild and uh, the treatment uh, some of them have been just isolated without treatment, while others had some treatment. So our experience has been um, that we have had a slow development of the epidemic, um, largely mild cases. Uh, we experimented with the hydroxychloroquine, and I think we're still using it. Now, in terms of uh, I'd been requested to say something about our progress. You know, developing countries, the African countries, we took the COVID experience very, very, uh, very, very seriously because as you all know, Africa was expected to have a very, very big bang, you know, very devastating. We have poorly developed health systems. So because of that, we have taken a largely preventive approach. Uh, we learned early about flattening the curve, and many African countries have de taken that approach. We had lockdowns before we had cases. So the, in terms of managing the cases, it has been a little easier. Uh, in terms of participating in the research and in vaccine development, because we also know that we are really disadvantaged. So most of our clinical trials with diseases, with drugs, are in partnership with international, uh, international uh, groups. So we are participating in that. Uh, but on the whole, apart from a few countries, uh, in Uganda, we have had our two deaths now, only two deaths. We are in 1,200, below 1,200 cases. And we have had two deaths, but these are deaths that occurred really outside the health facility. So I think uh, one thing to learn from the experiences in Africa and Uganda specifically is that we focused more on a public health approach. Find cases, most of our cases are found when they are not sick. And that explains why we have not had a lot of uh, uh, cases in the dying and also a lot of severe cases. Uh, we have jumped into vaccine research <laughs> and uh, we're basically trying to partner with a lot of uh, uh, people from more advanced countries because we don't know when the vaccines will reach us. 
So in countries like Uganda, we are beginning in partnership. Well, I think one of our research is in partnership with uh, uh, the London uh, Tropical Medicine. Uh, we also have uh, partnerships with the other groups internationally. So that is our experience. Uh, the major, major impact of the COVID on Africa is economic at this point really severe economic uh, damage. Monica, thank you so much. And uh, I hope you're not driving that car. Uh, somebody just corrected me. I, I described Africa as a country, and of course it's a continent, so I apologize. <laughs> a very, be very beautiful continent it is too. Actually, uh, Dr. Musonera segued into vaccines rather nicely. So Robin, um, give us a, a quick lowdown. You, you and Sarah Gilbert have become international personalities recently, I've noticed, but um, on the back of this amazing research. Of, well, but can you give us a quick global overview of where we are? Are you really going to save the world? So, I mean, I think that there's lots of encouraging news, but, um, you know, if you look at what's happening, we have 24 vaccines in clinical evaluation from starting from nothing. So within six months, 24 candidates into the clinic and another 160 you know, behind them. Um, so that's, that's the good news. Obviously the challenge is to demonstrate whether they work and that's a numbers game. And Ooh. it depends in terms of success, whether people are looking for vaccines that prevent disease um, or vaccines that prevent infection. And obviously a vaccine that prevents transmission is, is the ultimate goal. Whether that will be the first type of vaccine we see past the post, or whether we'll actually see vaccines that prevent severe disease coming through first it, it is really open, uh, an open question and we won't know till we see the data. The other challenge is that obviously, you know, I think the best scenario will be to see some of these vaccines coming through with a, a positive run towards the end of this year and the beginning of next year, and then we'll see more and more come through. But it's about access as well. So access to, to these vaccines is gonna be a challenge because the rich countries are already trying to, you know, advance purchase as many different candidates as they can, because there's no certainty that any one vaccine approach is gonna work. So if you have a lot of money, you, you're gonna spread your bets and buy as many options as possible. That means in terms of global access, it's gonna make it really uh, tough for low middle income countries to get vaccines any time in the short period um, from discovery to rollout. And the other challenge when you think about it is, is just the sheer volume. Thinking about the UK in the first place, if we want to vaccinate the entire UK population in the first half of next year, that's never been done. So we have to be very creative about thinking about the ways vaccination strategies, mass vaccination strategies can be done. But when you think about it globally, trying to come up with an approach for 7 billion people is an enormous undertaking. And currently, the, the biggest number of vaccines that are made a year is about half a billion doses of polio vaccine. Nobody's made uh, you know, a billion doses of any vaccine globally in any single year. So many challenges. Um, but hopefully a, a lot of potential success as well. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Robert. Let's go uh, now to Sean. Sean, um, a public health view on this, because, uh, you know, the, we, we, we've seen that the medics are doing well. Um, I just wonder what, what, whether you feel that the politicians are, are matching up to what the docs have been up to. Well, um we have made huge progress and, and delighted to hear Robin's uh, optimism about the vaccine because that's public health and if the vaccine can reach out uh, to across the world, that would be brilliant. As particularly because we do need to make sure that low and middle income countries have the access because they're becoming very hard hit by this disease. It's 188 countries now that have got, uh, have got COVID. It, it's the doubling time was only, was 38 days uh, to get from five to 10 million. And it's gone to 24 days to go the next five million. We've got a, we've got a disease that hasn't gone away. 
wherever we look, we can see Australia, there's a, a second uh, wave. Um, we can see it again in China, we can see it in countries like Hong Kong, where I used to work, where, who did really well to start with. So we're, what we're facing public health-wise here is how do we prevent, how do we act? And listening to um, the Director General of the WHO, he continually emphasizes those three simple messages about uh, washing our hands. We mustn't forget that. And I, and I know it may sound in this august company, like, uh, you know, not, not quite where it's at, but actually, unless we remember the simple messages about washing hands, wearing face masks and keeping our distance, uh, if we don't remember that, we're not going to be able to prevent the spread of this disease because however, however quickly the vaccines become available, uh, it is actually people living in poorer conditions. It is the social and health inequalities that are making this disease much worse in our poorer uh, communities. Uh, and I was very struck when listening to Srinath earlier on, Srinath Reddy, when he was talking about the need for policymakers to think about uh, the strategies to prevent non-communicable disease. This isn't just about preventing um, infectious diseases. This is about making sure our populations are more robust and able to cope with the disease should they get it. So less diabetes, less heart disease, uh, and particularly in, in our vulnerable communities. So I think our politicians need to think very hard about uh, the strategies they adopt. Uh, it, in the UK, we have seen Public Health England producing reports on inequalities and their impact on uh, the black and ethnic minority communities uh, and the increased rates there. We've also seen more shift towards obesity. That was an individual political politician, our prime minister affected by, uh, by, by COVID has understood that actually things like obesity are predisposing factors. So we need to use prevention. We need to keep our populations healthy. That will help us to fight uh, other pandemics as they come along because all those years ago, back when we did the work on SARS, we, we looked at what lessons we should learn the lessons that we learned then are as applicable now and they're very much based around some very basic public health as well as getting scientific collaboration. And I, I was very uh, impressed when Dr. Cantor raised that point that we need to collaborate. We need to put aside the sort of political point scoring that we're seeing, particularly with the, uh, with, between perhaps China and the US. Uh, we need to put that aside and actually think, how do we actually do this for the global good, not just for, uh, uh, you know, not just for ourselves. And, and I was delighted to hear Robin's plea that we made the vaccine available globally to the world rather than just to richer countries who can afford to stockpile various um, uh, various different vaccines to uh, make, you know, so that they, uh, they're backing all the horses in case one works and they can have the, the benefit for richer populations. Well, thank you, Sean. And I should have said thank you for interrupting your holiday in France, where I gather the weather is uh, rather more beautiful than it is here in rainy old London. Well, I think we better finish this session now. We could, of course, go on for very much longer.